Hi, in this mini lecture we're going to be talking about a few differences between engineering science and engineering design. And if you're an engineering student, most of your time, particularly in the first couple of years, is spent on engineering science. Uh, this involves analysis, as we'll see, but as especially you get to your senior year, there's more and more focus on what we call engineering design. And understanding the differences between these is critical if you're going to be a successful designer. And I want to stress that I'm going to go through very quickly a few slides to give you a very brief introduction to this topic. But to really become a designer, to understand the philosophy of design is not something you're going to get by watching a lecture. It's essentially going to take you a lifetime time to develop. Now before we begin, it's probably worth stating that design um, is a very individual thing. We all have our styles of design. Uh, we all bring different things to the design process. And so what I'm going to talk about are generalities, and they may not completely apply to you. But as people have looked across many, many designers, these are some of the differences they found between what we might classify engineering science, which you've done in most of your classes, and what we would call engineering design, which is what capstone design courses focus on. In engineering science, typically you're given well-defined problems. And, and what do we mean by this? It means that there is a solution of some type. Um, if you're given a homework set, you expect to converge and have the problems have solutions. It's very rare that they don't. Um, there's also an optimal approach. Now, you can define optimal in different ways, that it essentially takes the least time, it has the most accurate answer, and things like that. But depending on how you define optimal, there's an approach that's pretty optimal. And generally, this is the answer or the approach that your instructor wants you to write down on a homework problem. And in order to solve problems in engineering science, you basically focus on a strategy. How do I solve this type of problem? This is a, a block on a plane problem. It's a flow problem. It's a, a Thevenin and a Norton equivalent problem. And really, in solving these types of problems, you focus on strategies. And of course, problems don't change when you're solving them. If you're asked to calculate um, essentially what the current is in some circuit, that is a fixed problem. It's not changing as you're actually working on that homework problem. However, in engineering design, uh, we generally work on what are called ill-defined, or sometimes they're called wicked problems, not because they're evil or bad, but because they're very, very wicked to solve. Um, in these types of problems, it's not always clear, or may not even usually be clear, what the problem is. Um, you're making some assumptions about what the problem is, but other people may come to different assumptions. And what that means is the problem itself, the way you define it, the constraints on the problem or the limitations on the problem, and the solution evolve together. As you work toward a solution, the problem itself may take on a different aspect, and the problem may, may change and you may find you're not solving the right problem. And this is a really important point, that the problem changes as the designer understands more. In these types of engineering design problems, the more you understand and immerse yourself in the problem, the more you're going to see the problem that you're solving actually changes. And, and this is kind of frightening in a way, because how can we solve a problem if the problem is constantly changing? Um, <clears throat> and we'll get to that in a minute. In engineering science problems, the process you go through to solve the problem is convergent. Um, basically, as you work on a problem, you converge toward a solution. It might be the wrong solution. You have to start over. But once you get the right approach down, um, once you get the right strategy down, you generally work closer and closer to the solution of that problem. When you get to the solution, you're done. It's the end of the effort you're making. You say, OK, I solved this problem. If I've done a good job, I've solved this class of problems. I know how to do this now, and I'm done. And so really what you're doing when you're working on engineering science problems is you're focusing on understanding the solution path. Because if you really understand the solution path for this types of type of problems, you may have to plug in different numbers. But you know how to solve the problem once you've solved it before. Of course, this isn't true for engineering design problems, because the type of thinking you go through just isn't converging on an answer, but it's a process of convergent and divergent thinking. Now, what do I mean by this? What it means is that as you work on a problem, you may think you know what the problem is and are working and converging toward a solution, but you get to a point where you say, gosh, that's not the problem I'm really solving. And you have to diverge away and open up your thinking again to say, OK, this isn't the right problem. How do we reconceive of this problem? Think divergently to look at a new solution space. And so essentially what you're doing is by creating solutions to the problem, 
you're not solving the problem, but this is actually a process of helping to redefine the problem, of helping to understand the problem better. So the focus on engineering design is not to understand the path to the solution, but often to get a solution very, very quickly so you can understand the problem space and then rework, revise, improve, or what we call iterate on that problem. Solve it many, many times, gaining new understandings each time. In engineering science, the real focus is on analysis. The path to a solution is found by analyzing the problem. Um, it's either a type of problem I know how to solve and I plug in the numbers, or it's a type of problem I don't know how to solve and I actually have to go through the convergent thinking process to arrive at a pathway to a solution. But once you analyze that problem, you've pretty much got it. In engineering design, on the other hand, the focus is not on analysis as much as it is on iteration. The path to a final solution is through intermediate solutions. And this is kind of frightening because you don't solve a problem once. You solve it over and over and over again. And every time you solve that problem, you learn more about it. And so we expect sort of partial solutions on the way to the end or the stopping point of an engineering design process. So one way you can think about the differences is that in engineering science, you start off by defining the problem. You say, OK, this is the type of solution that solves this problem type. And once I get this, I solve the problem this particular way. I know how to do it. And once you discover the path, as I've said, you can use it on all problems of that class on problems. In engineering design, however, you don't define the problem, but you scope the problem, sort of like scouting out something. You have to define what the problem really is. You may not know it when you start the problem. You have to explore the possible solution space. Um, and it may be that your first guess is going to limit that solution space. And you have to sort of expand your thinking and look at it divergently or from different angles to really understand what the problem is. And you have to be constantly asking yourself not what class of problem this is so I can do a plug and chug answer, but how can I change the problem space? How can I reconceptualize this problem fundamentally so I have more options or cheaper options or better options to solve it? So this all sounds really good. Um, let's take a look at some very specific examples and try to compare an engineering science problem or the way a problem would be looked at in engineering science to the way the same problem would be looked at in engineering design. So here's a figure that I copied out of some physics book somewhere, or maybe a statics book or a dynamics book. You know, this is a pretty standard engineering problem. Let's look at some of the questions you might be asking yourself or information you'd be trying to find as you solve this problem in the engineering science tradition. Well, one of the first things you're going to do, because you've been trained to do it this way, is draw some arrows on this problem of what the forces are. You learn this in your freshman physics course. And you essentially are trained to ask, what are the forces on this problem? Um, another question you might ask yourself is, is there friction? Uh, chances are you're going to ignore friction, especially in your sophomore and, and freshman years. Um, it makes the problem harder. Um, and so you have a set of assumptions to simplify the problem. Again, you're moving down a convergent path to a solution. Um, can we assume one gravity of acceleration? Is this done on Earth, or did the professor say, OK, this is on Mars. So you've got to plug in a different number for that gravity of acceleration that's going to be pulling down the, the weight right there. Um, how many times does the rope go through the block and tackle? Because you probably know that when you solve this type of problem, you sort of trade the amount of force you have to pull to lift the weight for the length of the rope. And so that's a, a question you ask, because you've been trained to do it for this type of problem. And then what formula do I use? Where do I go in my book to look up the formula for solving block and tackle type problems once I've got all these other things take care of? The problem space in engineering design over here looks very, very different. Instead of having arrows and questions point you to specific information, you have a bunch of things you don't know. And those are represented by these red question marks here. Let's take a look at what we mean by that. Um, one of the questions you'd ask in engineering design is, what's the most weight we'll ever need to lift? Because that's going to very much determine some of the parameters for the design problem. Another question you might ask yourself is, what are the pulleys rated for? Uh, if the pulleys aren't rated for the type of weight they're going to be holding, then the whole contraction can come down on my head, and I've got real problems. Another type of question is, can beam hold that much weight? Uh, certainly, if we're strapping something to a beam and trying to lift more, we may pull the whole house down on our head, which is a really bad outcome, I think, as an engineer. And then, how much does the rope cost per meter? Um, 
because there's cost associated with this. We need to understand the cost of the economic space besides just the engineering space of this problem. And then there are other considerations, such as is A over here, this hand, wearing gloves? Because if A is holding onto the rope and the rope begins to slip and they're not wearing gloves, we've got some safety concerns, especially considering the type of weight we're lifting, what's underneath it, and things like that. So as you can see, there are really different ways that you approach defining a problem over here on the engineering science side versus scoping out a problem and trying to understand that problem more deeply on the engineering design side. So as we go on to the next slide, let's take a look at really some of the fundamental differences that I've been explaining at length um, as we go through this. If you look at the engineering science versus engineering design, on the science side, key skills are classification. What type of problem is this? And in order to solve these types of classification problems, you need to speak the language of mathematics. And a whole bunch of your training as an engineering student is on classifying types of problems and learning how to speak mathematics. However, on the engineering design side, the key skills focus on the process because in scoping out this problem and understanding that there's a problem space that's multidimensional I have to move through and my success in design really is my, my motion, my path through the problem space, um, the process for doing that becomes really important. And really you're asking how do I iteratively move through the problem space and define and redefine and better understand problems. And here the language you think you're thinking in is very different than the precise mathematical language, although you will use that in engineering design. The, the language at this point are things like sketches, images, models, really trying to frame this problem space in your head. And as you can imagine, this type of language really is much more open to your creativity and opens up your mind a little bit more than the very precise language of mathematics, which is not to say the sciences is not important. Its design just uses a different set of skills in many cases. So before we end, I'd like to give you a big picture view and to compare some of the things that you've probably been studying as an undergraduate in engineering, in science and mathematics, and also in what you might call your fuzzy studies courses, the social sciences and humanities. Because engineering design fits into a very particular space in relationship to the studies of mathematics and sciences and the studies of social, the social sciences and the humanities. So let's take a look at the big pictures of these sort of three domains, sciences, humanities, and design. In sciences, if we look at what is studied, they're really concerned with understanding the natural world. In the humanities, they want to know the human world with all the difficulties and uncertainties and fuzziness that goes along with being human. In design, we're concerned with the man-made world, the world that man has created to make our lives better on this earth. You can call it the artificial world, if we will. In science, they've developed a, a set of methods or a set of techniques that focus on experiment, classification, what is this, and analysis that help them understand the natural world. Over in the humanities, the skills are analogy, what's that like, metaphor, and evaluation of things to understand the human world. In the design world, the world we create as engineers, we use techniques like modeling, pattern formation, and synthesis across a wide range of ideas to basically create better artificial worlds. And each of these disciplines has its values, the things that they think are important, the things that the, your professors as students will tell you it's very, very important for you to assume and accept values in the class. And in the scientists, scientists value objectivity, they value rationality, and they're engaged in a search for truth. That's what they care about. Oftentimes, we affiliate ourselves with scientists rather than people in the social sciences as humanities. But over there, they value things like subjectivity. Is it important to me? Imagination. And they're interested in a quest or a search for justice. How do we have a more just world for human beings? In design, we're interested in other values, things like is it practical? Is it an ingenious design? Ingenuity is one of our values. And we search for appropriateness. Does the solution fit the problem as we broadly understand it? And that brings us to the end of what I really wanted to talk about. Um, essentially, we'll go to the last slide, 
which will just basically give you some things to explore this topic a little bit more in depth. Um, in engineering, there are two journal papers. If you have a subscription, you can download these, one from the Journal of Engineering Education and another in the journal Design Studies that go over the things I've talked about very broadly. If you'd like to really dive into depth, I strongly recommend Larry Bucchiarelli's book, Designing Engineers, where he talks about many of the human aspects and how actual engineers implement this type of design thinking in their their work on the job. And then an overview is Nigel Cross's designerly ways of knowing. Uh, particularly the, the information here was drawn from Chapter 6, and that's a good place to look to try to understand these topics more in depth.